behalf of the Historical Society doing a presentation called Antique Oddities. Sort of a uh, what is it, what was it, what did it do? Okay. What was it? Oh. My kids said it looked like it was part of a pipe organ. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth, my husband said that too. So. <laughs> Somebody else, that's right. This is a very, very old candle holder mold, and I just want to point some of that out. I'm passing everything around. A lot of them will have a little white sticker on it. If you can just be careful of the white sticker. It's part of the cataloging system that we have in the Historical Society. So if it falls off, just give it to me or let me know. Um, very rare candle holder maker. Now candles in itself, uh, were very expensive in colonial times. Remember, again, there was no lighting in colonial times. So when the sun went down, the only light you had was from typically the hearth, the fireplace going in your living room. Um, when, you, when you went to bed or when you moved from room to room, you carried a little candle holder or you carried what they called, what was the bedroom called? Bedrooms were called the chamber. So you took your chamber stick and went you through the house. Wax was actually a big deal in colonial times. Uh, wax was very expensive, real wax. So generally what the early Americans did, or again all this before the light bulb, was you had to make your wax. Now in order to get real wax, again it was expensive, and only the very, very wealthy could generally afford it. Everybody else used what they called a, a paraffin, if you will. Uh, they made wax generally out of animal fat. Um, out of bayberries. Bayberry was a very common used item for making wax. You would take the bayberry, you would boil it down, and then like a fat-like substance would float to the top. You would skim it off, and you would use something like that. You would, if you look, if you flip that over, you see tiny, tiny little holes on the other side, because you would string the wick through it. And the wick would, you'd probably knot it on the ends, and then pour the paraffin in. The thing with the paraffin is, it was very smelly, had a very strong odor, and it gave off a it's lot of smoke. Big. But even the wealthy used the cheaper version of the wax because just to save money. Again, wax was so very, very expensive. So that's a very early candle holder. Then later, okay, we kind of start to get away from the candles, and we have Little lanterns that were often just called liquid fuel lanterns. And this was very simple. You would put the kerosene in it. Sometimes there'd be a cloth wick in here. You could control the height of the flame. And this was great for going if you had to go outside or even from room to room. So this is basically a, a very early lantern. But it would be, you would use not wax, you would use some sort of fuel. Um, I don't know, it's a good question. Where did they get the kerosene? There were many different types of liquid burning fuels that they could use. Sometimes they could use the animal fats and other things. So. Uh, I think you know, did they ever put whale oil in the yeah. Somebody just asked me, uh, did they put whale oil? Whale oil, actually, what they would use would be what they called spermaceti. And the spermaceti came from the head of a sperm whale. And that's what they made real wax candles out of. Spermaceti became a very popular um, trade in the 1800s, but it was also Mondo. very expensive. Mondo. Okay. I was going to tell the door over there, Barbara. Oh, that's okay. Uh, this is also a very early lantern, dated 1908, made in Stonebridge, New York. Um, same premise as the other little lantern that's being passed around. But this was just a little bigger, a little stronger, maybe for outdoor work. Maybe on a you know windy night, you had to go out to the barn, or the outhouse. Who knows? Um, this is called a mica. It's a very thin. It's not a glass. I think mica seen it. They call it. Um, it's almost like a paper, and it was simply there to keep the flame inside, so the wind could blow it out. Don't worry about wrecking this, it's, it's, already, it's beyond uh, repair at this point. But it, this, uh, the whole top unfolds and kind of a neat apparatus. You can leave everything up there if you want, I'll pick it up at the end. Okay. All right, let's see if you guys remember these. Remember this. 
The stereoctopin. Right. It's called the stereoctopin. You can, I'm going to pass them around. You can touch them, play with them. You can be very, I'm saying it'd be really difficult to break them. <laughs> it slides right on. Don't even worry. Uh, this was a very, very popular item for families in the 1800s. This was a great a parlor game, if you will. It was a great way to learn about other countries, other places, other people. You know, remember, there was no radio, there was no TV, picture books were a rarity. So families would literally sit around the room, pass this around, and then when everyone had looked at it, read what was written on the back, they'd switch the card. This, uh, now that one, uh, you guys can try this one. If, when you look through here, you can actually adjust this to your sight. So you can move it in or out. And the picture, it's two pictures side by side. They're going to become three-dimensional once you look through the viewfinder. And then later on, we all have the kaleidoscopes. This, we all had the kids. This is the early version of the kaleidoscope, the stereotypes. And I'll pass around some of these. These would be sold in uh, boxes. So there could be, you know, 25, 50, 100 in a box. All different pictures of places all over the world, maybe upstate New York, different places in the country. So it really was a great learning tool for people. This is a neat one. This is a picture of a family from the 1800s. It could be. It'll tell you on the back what you're looking at. Yeah. All right, who wants to guess? A stove. No, it's not a stove. A heater. A safe? <laughs> not a heater, it's not a safe. Picture. Who said pictures? Kind of. Yes. Yeah, Early form box. of the projector. It's an early form of the projector. It's actually called a magic lantern. And um, I brought probably the, the most simplest one out of the collection. We have some that are far more elaborate. Some of them have two of these scopes. Some of them have three scopes, and they're about this high. These have actually been around since the 1600s. Uh, they originated over in Europe and eventually made their way to the States. And this was, the, again, it was the earliest form of a projection or a slideshow. And people, would, they were called lanternists. So a lanternist would travel, and I'm not even really sure how the setup on this was, but inside, I can pass this around, you can't break this, we can't break this. <laughs> inside, you ever heard the term dag daguerreotypes? The old daguerreotype glass frames? early turn of the century? Well, they would be sort of the same thing, a daguerreotype, it's about three and a half by four inches. It'd be a glass frame, and it would be hand-painted scenes. So the little glass frame would go inside the lantern. Behind that would be a piece of lime, a little piece of lime, and they would light the lime. So when the lime was on fire, it would, it would send um, sort of like a greenish, airy type of light through the glass, through the whole projector, and then it could be shown on a wall. So in Europe, it was actually used for sort of a uh, sort of in a macabre sort of sense. They showed you know like early versions of horror films and ghosts, and those types of things. But as it uh, progressed, if you will, people would actually travel throughout the country and they would give lectures on buildings or whatever it was. And this was the way that they, had, they would project the image onto a wall. So it evolved and eventually became very fancy up until about the 1930s these were used. And Kodak then came out with the, the little Koda, Kodachrome, I think, the little films that you probably all remember. So that would be the earliest version. Maybe we wanted to see this too. This was just a little writer yeah. on the one book if you wanted to pass it around. That's, that's me. I'm interesting. All right. Who wants to guess what's in the box? That's me. It looks like a hat box. It does look like a hat box. But you think it's a hat box? Through here. Raise your hand if you think it's a hat box. No. Uh, yeah. Feel like. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what do you think it is? I 
The top does um, screw off, but it is a gunpowder flask. Is it leather? It is leather. Yes, it's very old. Uh, it's missing one. It does, it don't does have a little Don't put this around your neck. Pass it down to me. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I have a couple more things. Watch it, man. This is missing a little piece to the top, but. Food grinder, nope. Is that it? Is that it? This is a doll's washing machine. Pass it around, just be careful. I'm missing the knob on the top. But if you turn the handle, the washers go up and down. And this would be used to wash the little dolls. Oh, my. It is glass, so I just ask you to be a little careful. <laughs> <laughs> Candle holder? Oh, yeah. no, so not a candle. Sort of. Sort of. It's not a musical instrument, but you're on the, the right. It's a horn. It's a horn of sorts that somebody would yell it to. It's a fire horn. And you can tell when you look at it, there would have been a, a little rope here that somebody would have maybe worn on their shoulder, around their neck. There's two fire hats. All along the base of it, this needs to be polished, uh, but along the base are engraved pumpers and hook and ladder trucks from the 1800s. And that's it, what you would do. You, the, the fire chief would use this to yell into at a fire. You know, so he would yell, you know, get the get the ladder or get the bucket of water, whatever orders he was shouting, he would use this. Now later, as that sort of the horn, if you will, I guess evolved, these became more of a ceremonial um, gift. So if a fire chief was retiring, this would be the gift he would get. He would get a silver plated or some sort of plated engraved horn. And this one is actually engraved. I had the paper. Pass this around. This one says, presented to Reliance H and L Company. What's the H and L name? Hook and Ladder. Hook and Ladder Company Number One um, of East Chester. Presented by Mrs. Sarah E. May on September 5th, 1892. Oh, wow. So I guess that's the one over near Evac. That would be, is that the old Reliance, you know? I Googled it and I couldn't find any address in East Chester where the Reliance Hook and Ladder Company number one was. The May family, I, that's a name I'm not familiar with either. They own the fee building. They own the fee building? Yeah, they own the fee building. They used to own the fee building. So what you're saying, the May, the May name is a very um, Tucker Hall family name, if you will. So Sarah May was very well known at one point. Oh, okay. And maybe you have information? No? Uh, other than the fact that uh, I know one of the ladies worked at the uh, Plaza Lounge. She was part owner. She was Dr. She was a May. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they owned another one of the uh, uh, a store right here in the small building across the street. Interesting. Okay. At a restaurant. Right. Yeah, they had a restaurant right next to the Okay. And Dottie Collabo should be here because her dad worked on the engine one. Oh, really? Okay, interesting. Well, maybe you guys can give me some more information going forward. I actually meant to show you this in 
the beginning because it has to do with what we think. Actually, you tell me what you think this is. Um, that's right. That's what we think it is anyway. I'm not going to take this off then. We think it's a very, very old candle snuffer. Now, generally, you see a candle snuffer, you know, like a little bit of a bell. Like a bell, yes. It's on a stick, and you snuff the candle out. Before those were made, they were look, you know, they, they were made like this, if you will. And they, I guess you put this over the top and you just snuffed it out. I don't know. Saul Raiden, who's the curator, didn't know much about it either. I looked it up, and the, the as far as I can tell, it's a, it's a very old candle snuffer. Generally, you'd see that made also with a pair of scissors on the end, because the scissors would trim the wick. So they were like a combination. So. All right, my last item. <laughs> what are they? Stocking stretchers. Stocking stretchers. Stocking stretchers. Oh, I don't know. We have a, oh, we have the pins on it all around. Uh, 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 I could, I could not find a lot of information on the internet about the stocking stretchers at all. Um, I did find that it was a 1947 issue of Popular Mechanics actually had the diagram and the instructions of how to build your own stocking stretchers. This had to be wool stockings or nylons. And I've, I've seen them on the internet, a lot of them have holes in them all the way down, which I suppose would allow for the air to flow So these, these don't have the holes. And they're actually, they're not expensive. People are starting to collect these. I see them on eBay every now and then. And what they do is, they, then they're, this is a very, very large chest. Generally, they're not as big. They're maybe only eight or ten inches like this. And they're different types of wood. And people are actually hanging them along their fireplace at Christmas, and they're adorable. And then the other one that I saw, which is very cute, if you ever see them, the ones that have the holes in them. People are using them for picture frames. They're putting pictures behind them. It's another cute idea. But they don't cost a lot of money. I, you know, my guess is maybe early 1900s into the 1940s or so, maybe earlier. Um, this one, I have to guess it was a man, or if it was a woman, I mean, her feet were enormous, and I don't know. So, but that's it, that's my presentation. I don't know if anyone wants to see Yes, I was just asked about the dolls uh, clothing, the washing machine for the dolls, and it says Wolverine underneath. Wolverine was the manufacturer. Also, uh, Kenmore. We all know Kenmore makes washers and dryers. Kenmore, actually, I saw on the internet, uh, eBay and Workpoint, these are some antique sites. They actually had a version of a doll washing machine as well. It was a little more elaborate. Um, it had more cranks and it had the washing, the washboard above it, but the same error. So apparently, several companies made them. The other thing I read, which might not be true for this one, but maybe the more elaborate ones, is traveling salesmen brought them with them. When they went you know, door to door trying to sell a washing machine, they would bring a little model like that so they could show people how it works. So that's a good question. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you very much for the donation. Thank you very much. Thank you.